Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Kendrina Bailey and I'm the executive director here at Coquitlam Heritage. I almost forgot where I was for a moment there, I apologize. Um, Coquitlam Heritage is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nations, who continues to live on these lands and care for them, along with the waters and all that is above and below. These lands are also the traditional territories of the Ustolo, Tsleil-Waututh, Kekite, and Katsi First Nations. I welcome you all to Mackin House. Um, it's a squishy, squishy place, but it's very intimate and lovely, and, and I hope you enjoy the, the presentation. I'm just going to introduce you to Marcus <laughs> Farner. He's our, uh, well, he's the curator of the, of the exhibit that you just saw, but he's actually our exhibits manager. Um, so here. Thank you. I'll try, not to, I'll try not to switch this off. Yeah, yeah so uh, my name is Marcus. I'm the exhibition manager here. And I just, I don't want to bore you too much with like a long spiel about this exhibition. But what happened, uh, I think about a year ago, we came up with, well, we decided that like some of our items from our collection, they need to live online so that the museum is accessible. Right? It's really crucial that we don't just lock things away in the vault and no one can see it. So the idea was like, well, what should we do uh, to present these items? So we can just kind of bring out all the Edwardian teacups that we have and all the other old European things and display them in the house, right? Great. Uh, but we thought like, well, no, museums have always been gatekeepers, right? In the past, we decided what is culture, we decided what is hot and what is not, and whose voices are heard in the museum. And more often than not, it will probably be something like me, like a white old guy, right, who kind of decides what is being displayed or something. So we thought, like, nah, this is really not what Coquitlam Heritage is about. We've got to change this up, and it's really, really important that we sort of kind of I'm not saying that we're leaders in that, but we kind of really push this agenda. Um, so the idea was, what should we do? How would all kinds of other people interpret the items from our collection? So then we decided to put a call out. And it was actually really great because the Vancouver Foundation gave us a grant for it. They helped us, assisted us with this project uh, that could work and that we could pay the artist and not just kind of leech off their creativity and have it in, in this museum and say thank you very much but we actually are able to pay them which is also really important for sort of an ethical stance of that museums have. Anyway we put a call out and I think we selected really a really wide range of artists that and then that was the important thing, you know, like how would someone, maybe coming from a different culture, uh, from a different point of view, how would they interpret the items from our collection? And now I'll stop talking and she and Jill, right, will perform for you guys live. Thank you so much. <laughs> For me, everybody got different artifacts to work with. I got um, a collection of so many pictures, over 100 pictures, and my task was to go through and see like, where is their story, where is there something that's interesting to me, what do I want to, um, how do I want to reframe this moment and, and share something to connect to now. Um, and the first pictures that I found in Robit, and you'll see them if you go up after, are these really delightful pictures of these two people with like, Perfectly styled hair, perfect outfits, perfectly pressed skirts, heels, like traipsing through the forest, like on stumps, on things, climbing through. Um, and I thought that was delightful in and of itself. And then I also was inspired by um, a friend of mine and myself who spent a lot of time in the forest dreaming of other realities and other ways of being and popping into these kind of magical spaces. Um, and I dreamt up this song, which ended up a bit also being um, a tender holding of the fact that I'm queer and there have always been queer people, but not everybody gets to be out and not everybody gets to live the way that I get to live now. And so this friend and I 
uh, were both queer, and I was thinking about us as them back then, and what it would mean to only be able to be our true selves when we're out with each other in this nature space, and then having to pack back up. Uh, and I wrote this. <laughs> So there's a place by the water, just out of view of my parents' front window. There's a place by the water we go. And the place by the water is a portal, as places by water we her and me. We're magic, we're mages, we're knights, and there are pages, we're formless, we're free. by water will be her and me. We creep there at midnight, swap stories by moonlight, breathless visions of who we could be, her and me. So there's a place. Nothing counts there, nothing. pictures of like military ships, military equipment, and stuff for World War II. And so I was looking at those pictures and I was thinking about war. And then there was also this kind of charming picture, which you'll see if you go up. I think there's a cow, and then there's two humans who I think are siblings, like a brother and a sister with their cow. And I was thinking about um, like gender roles, particularly on a farm that is dependent on so much manual labor where like everybody has to work, it has to work really hard because of the nature of the work. As one thought, and as a second thought, I was thinking about like the gendering that happened in World War II, thinking specifically among white, white folks, of men were conscripted and went to war, and suddenly there was this huge gap in the workplace, and so many women entered the workplace for the first time, which was like uh, cited as an important event in like, feminism, particularly white feminism, but men were away at war and died. And I just was like, these, the patriarchy is very harmful to everybody. And I'm curious about what happens if I try to write a song. And this is what I wrote. We grew up on the land, passing shovel hand by hand. He and I could look busy doing nothing, and we did. We grew up on the farm, riding horseback arm in arm. He was stronger, I was braver. I made sure he knew that's what sisters do. We grew up on the land, and sometimes in class, barely caring if we passed. We'd race all the way home. We grew up on the farm with each other, just me and my brother. Every step, us two. I wonder when we 
there comes a day we're guided separate ways. I guess that's how it goes. I learned sewing, I learned baking, conversation making, the hard work of building a home. I blink and then. Concepts I don't get to know. He moves in places I don't get to go. He lives a life that's a one way mirror. I tell myself it's fine. But we grew up side by side. How's he not filled with? Women three times my age tell me none of this is me. They give tips to help us through. 1942. <laughs> I learned that men must fight and die, and women weep. And these are rules we have to keep. Somehow the price is not too of this May Day Parade, which I don't know if any of you know what that is. I had to look it up. But what I see in the pictures is all of these, I'm assuming little girls with their matching haircuts, matching white dresses in lines like this. I'm like, what is happening? This kind of like competition. And I learned that every May Day, this day in May, a May Day queen is crowned. And there are very specific like rules about what you wear, the flower crown, the gloves, and they compete for like who will be the best Mayday Queen, and I saw this, and my first thoughts, I was like, ooh, it's like a competition of like hyper pure femininity. I was like, ee, something about this feels ee, messy to me. And at the same time, I had echoing in my head, maybe because I had just been thinking about like the war and ships and that, that cry for help of Mayday, Mayday, like something's wrong, taken from the French of Mayday, Mayday, help me, help me. Like, oh, there's something in here, and I don't know what it is, and I'm playing the guitar, and I can't find it. I wonder what it is. And I go for a walk, and suddenly I'm like bombarded with the voice of this. I imagine them as this like badass gender queer person in the 40s, who's like, you want to talk about gender norms? I will fuck children. <laughs> <laughs> mm, do that so good. I will take those gender roles uh, and flip them. And I came home and wrote this like villain song for this person. So um, we're switching to piano and switching to a very different, very different vibe. Different vibe. Yeah. Um, this song is called Mayday. Ready? Mm -hmm. Dainty socks on dainty feet. Thick skirts with perfect clothes. Smile and smile and hit repeat. I'm ready. I'm ready. Tender looks and tilted.
and what's a fear? I'm ready. Exactly as Marcus is named, lots of these pictures were like of white folks who were building their lives here, building homes, finding work, creating a life. And I was thinking about the fact that one, like building a new life is very difficult and coming from far away is uh, emotionally difficult, physically difficult, financially difficult. And as we like leave our places of home and of relation, we are often leaving so much culture and so much knowledge behind. But the price of that here is like cultural disruption for other parties, because as we know, this, this land is and was occupied. And so I, as I'm trying to write songs about these people here, I don't want to, to, to glorify, but I also want to acknowledge. And I was like, I don't, know, I don't know how to write this song, but I want to. And I was thinking about, I took a workshop maybe three years ago now with um, Keith Barker, who some of you might know. He is um, the artistic director at Native Earth Performing Arts in Toronto, Toronto. He's Métis, and I was in a workshop with him, and he was like, where are your ancestors from? And I was like, mm, I think they're from like UK somewhere, or like a Heinz 57 of Europe, I think. And he was like, well, where specifically? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's important. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And he's like, even more important, like, do you know why they came? And I had never even thought. And he was like, it's important because obviously they came here for something that was urgent, probably uh, life-threatening, probably. Those stakes are important to understand why they came and to help understand like, how your lineage started being here. And so as I'm thinking about this and thinking about the song I want to write, I start thinking about how, or like in my life, many folks who left their homelands would never go back. And there's a lot of... Um, and ancestral knowings that are lost, and there's a lot of disruption that happened here. And I started thinking, if the land of my ancestors were to sing a song as my ancestors are leaving, knowing that they would probably never come back, um, what would it say? And I wrote this one, and this is the one that we'll leave you with. I'd like to pack you a bag before you go home. 
that you're ready though. I like to see you more. I guess I'll see you at the shore. Small waves, chest caves, I don't fake a smile. Say I'll see you in a while. Parents worry. Take it all with you. All with you. I'd like to pack you a bag before you go. Filled with everything we know. Filled with music and mysteries and language and histories. All the things you can't touch. So much science and scripture, medicinal mixtures, the landscapes you learn by foot, and the essays and etchings, poetic far fetchings, traditions you never understood. Take it all with you. Change. 